Hi there, and welcome back to the second episode in this Composing Cinematic Music for Movies, TV Shows, and Video Games series. In the last episode, we talked about some of the basics of getting started creating music in your DAW, how a DAW functions, and some of the important buttons and tools within our DAW. Now, obviously, there's a lot more to learn within our DAW and a lot more to learn when it comes to the music creation process. But before we get to that, we need to talk about what is the topic of this second video, and that is sample libraries. So as I said in the last episode, the DAW sort of functions as both the camera and Photoshop when it comes to the music creation process. It both creates the music and edits it, if you will. But one thing that is still the case is that the sounds that come in the DAW for the music creation process are not the best sounds available to us. The companies that create the DAWs specialize really in audio manipulation and audio editing. They don't specialize in sound creation, particularly when it comes to live instruments and sounds that sound like real human beings playing real instruments. When it comes to things like synths or artificial drums, they do a much better job on average. But today I wanna to talk to you about sample libraries, which is really the second part of the equation when it comes to what we need on our computer in order to get started making music. So a sample library essentially functions as the instruments that we're going to use. Generally speaking, if we're composing music for a cinematic genre, we're gonna be composing for the orchestra. What this means is that we want sample libraries which specialize in creating orchestral sounds. So we want strings, brass, woodwinds, percussion, tune percussion, and a piano. That's gonna be a great place to get us started. Maybe later on down the road, we wanna add some synths and some other hybrid textures, but for now getting started, the course is really gonna focus on the orchestral aspect of writing cinematic music. So how does a sample library work? A sample library is effectively a group of recordings which have been combined by people who are really good with computers to create something which sounds like a player playing an instrument. Now that's sort of confusing. Let me give a little bit more detail. Think of a symphony orchestra that goes and records the score to a movie. Generally speaking, the way that's done is that the composer, along with some orchestrators and some others, come together to take the music that he or she has written for the movie and to transform it into sheet music, which can then be played by the orchestra. Now these players specialize in a sort of sight reading, in quickly learning, in being able to play within a couple hours or a couple days of having seen the music for the first time. Now I'm sure this isn't always the case, but compared to an orchestra which you're seeing touring the world, playing already existing classical pieces of music with months and months of practice, this is a very different skill set, And it's a pretty remarkable one when you think about it. But there's also a reason that a lot of film scores tend to be in keys like D minor or E minor or G major. Keys with fewer sharps and flats are gonna do well in a film score setting because you don't have to deal with all of the accidentals on the sheet music and it's much easier for the players to actually play the music live without having had a ton of practice. Now, generally speaking, they're really skilled and they can deal with some of these sharps and flats, but there's a reason that composers tend to stay away from them a little bit. Now that's getting a little bit ahead, I know, but I just wanted to throw it out there because I find it interesting. So when it comes to creating a sample library, effectively what happens is that instead of sitting down with an orchestra to record a piece of music, you sit down with an orchestra to record them playing individual notes, which can then be played back through the computer to sound like the player is playing that note. So what a company who's creating a sample library will do is that they will go into the building or the room where an orchestra plays they will sit down with the whole orchestra and then with the individual sections of the orchestra, whether that be the first violins, second violins, cellos, trumpets, French horns, flutes, oboes, clarinets, etc., etc., and they will record them playing all the different notes that their instrument is capable of playing and in many different articulations, meaning many different types of ways of playing the same note. They also sometimes will play slurred transitions between notes they will sometimes record different instruments playing together to give you very commonly used orchestration techniques. There are multiple ways of doing this, and there's a lot of technology that goes into creating sample libraries. And I'm gonna throw this in the category of, if you're interested, please do more research. There's a lot of videos and a lot of reading to do online in regards to how sample libraries are made and recorded. For the purpose of this series, all we really need to know is that they exist and that they sound really 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 good so let's hop on over into ableton and we're going to take a look at two sample libraries which are free which give us orchestral sounds to work with so here we are in ableton and as i discussed last time we use a midi track for drawing in notes and creating original sounds we use an audio track for manipulating existing audio so here i have a midi track 
I'm going to drag in the main plugin which we're going to be using in the beginning of this course, and that is the BBC Symphony Orchestra. So in Ableton, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on my plugins tab here on the left, and I'm going to go to my search bar and I'm going to type in BBC. Now I'm going to click and drag this BBC Symphony Orchestra and I'm going to drag it onto an empty MIDI track. Now I'm going to talk a little bit further down the video in regards to how to actually download the BBC Symphony Orchestra and get it to appear within your DAW. But for now, the important part is the process of getting a plugin or a sample library dragged into a MIDI track. You can think of plugins as effectively sort of add-ons or maybe a downloadable app on your phone. It's something which is an addition to the pre-existing software. So plugins don't come with your DAW. They are separately designed and made by external companies, sometimes the same company that produces the DAW, but for the most part, they are other companies creating what are called plugins, which have many different functions. Sometimes they are audio effects. Sometimes in this case, they are sample libraries for the purpose of creating sound. So after you've dragged your BBC Symphony Orchestra plugin onto a MIDI track, you're going to get a screen which pops up and looks something like this. Now, it should be quickly noted that we can escape this screen and get back to where we were before in Ableton just by hitting this red X in the top left corner. In order to get back into the plugin, we're going to hit this button right here. So now that we're in the plugin, let's take a look at a couple of things. There's a lot going on here. Again, that is going to be a common theme in the beginning. But once we point out some of the main different sections here, you're going to realize it's not really too complicated. So the way this plugin works is that you choose your instrument by hovering over the top here where it says piano. Now you can click on it and a menu will pop up. And here through scrolling up and down, we can choose the different instruments that we have available to us. So in this free version of the BBC Symphony Orchestra, we've got a piano, the main sections of the string orchestra, the main sections of the brass orchestra, the main sections of the winds, and some percussion, which includes both tuned and untuned percussion. Now, another way to navigate between these instruments is that in the free version, a really helpful diagram has been given to us. So these, this different colored section here effectively is showing us the different locations of where these groups sit, which is going to be helpful for a couple of reasons a little bit later on. But for now, I think it's just nice to see and visualize, okay, these are where the different sections of the orchestra are located. It helps you get an idea of that blurred sound, and it'll also help you notice next time you go to watch an orchestra that, generally speaking, the way they sit almost always follows some version of what we have in front of us. So in front, we've got the piano. Now the piano might be located in different places because a piano isn't always and frequently actually is not really part of a symphony orchestra, but for now, the piano is in front. Then we've got our first violins in this green. The strings are represented by a green color, second violins, violas, celli, and double basses. Now the blue represents woodwinds. So behind the violas, we've got the bassoons representing the low end of the woodwinds. Then moving to the left, we've got clarinets, oboes, flutes, and piccolo representing the highest range within the woodwinds. Now the red is going to represent brass in this case. So we've got the French horns all the way to the left. And then all the way to the right, we've got trumpets, tenor trombone, bass trombone, and tuba. And then behind them, we've got our tuned percussion section, our untuned percussion section, and a harp and celeste sound. So we get all of these sounds available to us for free through the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Now that we have the piano selected, what we can do is create a MIDI clip as we did before in the prior video and draw in some notes. For the purpose of this video, I'm not gonna do that because this isn't about creating music. What I'm going to do is just play a few notes on my keyboard, which I've got plugged into my computer, just to give you an idea of the sounds that come out of this plugin. So if I were to play a C minor chord, that's the sound we get. If I were to play a G major chord, Or to play a C minor chord way up here, or maybe way down low. So as you can see, if you've got a piano plugged into your computer or a MIDI keyboard, which I'm going to discuss in my video talking about the gear that you need in order to produce cinematic music, you can essentially play this as if it were a piano. If you have speakers or headphones or even just your computer speakers, you can plug a keyboard into your computer and with this plugin, now through the combination of the plugin and the DAW, we can just play a piano and 
it'll essentially function as if we have a piano in front of us. Now I should say, it's not going to quite sound the exact same as if you're playing a real piano. Once again, this comes back to the sort of 5% thing that I talked about in the last video, which is that plugins still, sample libraries still missing are missing about 5% or so of the realism. They're almost there. Sounds about 95% of the way there, but it's not all the way. But it still is really pleasant to just sit down in front of us and be able to play a piano. And what's super fun about this is that not only can we play the piano, we can do something which we can't do with a real piano, which is that I can select some oboes. And now I can play the same C minor chord and it'll be as if the oboes are playing a C minor chord. So that is the beauty. That is obviously what we cannot do with a piano and that is the big benefit of working with plugins is that we can switch back and forth between all these different sounds. If I go to my tuned percussion, I've got my tubular bells. Pretty cool sound. We've got a glockenspiel, which is a really, really pretty sound. I love it layered with a lead melody. A really, really pretty sound. We've got lots of different sounds available to us. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna open up, let's say the violas. And I'm gonna talk about a few buttons that come within our plugin. Now, one of the beauties about the free version of this plugin is that you're not overwhelmed with information. The core and professional versions of this plugin, which are, don't get me wrong, are most definitely upgrades to it. But if you're just getting started, not being overwhelmed with information is an awesome benefit. So down at the bottom of our plugin, we've got a few really important knobs to adjust. One, starting all the way to the left here is what's called our expression knob or our expression control. Effectively, what this is, you can think of this as just a volume knob. We're turning up and down the volume like you would on a computer. So I've got my violas open. I'm gonna hold down a middle C. And when I drag this knob up and down, you're gonna hear the volume change. It's gonna go down and then back up. Now to the right of our expression is what is called the mod wheel or the modulation wheel, the dynamic controller. It sort of has two different names. It's both the mod wheel, modulation wheel, and it's called dynamics. They both are essentially referring to the same thing. Although technically speaking, dynamics can be referred to in a much broader sense, musically speaking. So I'm just gonna refer to this as the mod wheel because that's also really commonly what it's called. And that only ever refers to this specific knob. So the difference between expression and the mod wheel is that while expression just changes overall volume, what the creators of sample libraries have done in order to get the sounds to sound more realistic is that if you know anything about the way an orchestra plays, sometimes an instrument plays really loud, sometimes they play really soft. And that's a much different thing than simply turning down the volume on a computer. They're physically playing the instrument softer. And we need to be able to replicate that some way in our music creation process. And this is exactly what the modulation wheel is for. So if I play this C minor chord, now the mod wheel is all the way up. If I drag it, I've got a button on my keyboard that's assigned to this mod wheel. If I drag this down, notice that this isn't just bringing the volume down, it sounds as if the players are actually softer. Now the volume definitely goes down, but that's a very different thing than dragging this knob down. Because while I drag the expression up and down, the intensity with which the wheels are playing isn't changing. Is actually going to be the most important sort of knob that we are changing and adjusting as we are playing. And so if I just play a few chords here, you can get an idea of what I mean. If I just switch back, let's just say I switch back and forth between a C minor and a G major. with a little bit of playing with a little bit of the mod wheel, all of a sudden the music feels much more lively as we hear something that sounds more like real players moving sort of up and down with this wave of dynamic emotion.
wasn't the best uh, <laughs> example. My microphone is sort of blocking my mod reel, making it hard to change and play at the same time. But I hope that that gives you a little bit of a basic idea as to how the mod wheel functions and how we can use it to make our music sound more realistic and come to life. Now, once again, with all of these knobs, with everything I'm talking about, when it comes to the music creation process, I'm gonna talk about them again and again. You don't need to have a mastery just yet. We're just talking about what they do and their function right now so that we can get to actually creating some realistic sounding music. So the other thing we need to look at within our plugin are what are called articulations. Now, different instruments have different ways of playing. Sometimes there's a lot of similarity, sometimes there's some key differences. If we switch again, let's go to our French horns. We've got just two options available to us in the free version of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. We've got down in this bottom right section what are called long and staccatissimo. So the long is exactly what it sounds like. If you hold down a note, it'll be as if the French horn player is holding down that note. So if I play a C minor here, sort of goes for as long as I'm holding down the notes on the keyboard. Now if I go to the staccatissimo, this is going to be a very different sound. If I just hold it down, the sound is only going to last for about a second. So staccatissimo is a way of playing that's different than a long or a sustained note. So when it comes to writing for orchestra, two of the most common ways of playing are some version of a long note or some version of a short note. So a lot of sample libraries will go in and record players playing different lengths of short notes and sometimes different ways of playing long notes. If I go to my violins, for example, you'll see that we have a few more options here. Now we've got the spiccato, which is pretty similar to the staccatissimo from the French horns. We've also got our longs. And then we've got what is called pizzicato. And so this is sort of a way of playing where the string player actually plucks the string with their finger. You'll hear this has a very short and plucky sound to it. Down in the lower register of the strings, the pizzicato has a really beautiful sort of, there, there's a little bit more body to the sound. Something like that. If I go back up to my strings, you'll see we have one more option available to us, and this is what's called tremolo. You can think of this as both a fast and long way of playing. Um, it's sort of when the string players are moving their bow very, very fast whilst playing sustained notes. So that sounds a little something more like this. pretty cool sound. So as we go back and forth between some of the different instruments, you'll notice that we have some different ways of playing available to us. Looks like the woodwinds mostly have long and staccatissimo. The brass have long and the staccatissimo. The strings are going to have the long spiccato, pizzicato, and then every group except for the basses is going to have the tremolo. A piano is just sort of one there's not really the same different versions of playing a piano. If you want to play a short note, you can just actually just click a short note on the piano or long, you can hold it down. The piano responds much more as if you're playing an actual piano. Um, if we go to our harp, we've got just one different, one way of playing the harp in this instance, we've got the harp plucks. that with the celeste again it's a similar thing and that's all we need to know in the beginning now for our plugins now the bbc symphony orchestra recently updated such that the free version actually comes with a piano if you would like to change it up and have two different pianos available to you there's another free piano that comes from spitfire which is a very beautiful piano and this is a piano that comes from their labs plugin 
So if, I'm, if I type labs up in my plugins, I'm going to click and replace the BBC Symphony Orchestra by clicking and dragging onto the same MIDI track. Now you'll notice that this says labs, and it's sort of this shaped box looking thing. I don't even know what to really technically call it, which represents the plugin. If I go back to the BBC, just so you can follow, when I click and drag this onto the MIDI track, notice that this same shaped plugin now says BBC Symphony Orchestra. Now if I go back to labs, I can also click and drag down to that uh, same box location as I just did, or you can click and drag onto the MIDI track. That'll always work as well. So now what I want to do is get my piano up. So in Labs, Labs is Spitfire's um, plugin, which once a month or so they release a new free sample library within the plugin. So there's all sorts of sort of weird, funky, experimental sounds. They're not sampled at the same quality as some of the libraries which you can purchase from them, but there's still a lot of really fun things to play with here. But one of the most beautiful sounds that comes for free is this soft piano. So this soft piano has sort of this sound to it. So now we've talked about how to get the plugins open and some of the basic functions within our sample libraries. Let's head on over to Spitfire's website and I will give you a quick overview of the website and how to download these properly. So here we are on Spitfire Audio's website. It's called spitfireaudio.com. Um, in order to find these libraries amongst all of the <laughs> uh, huge selection of libraries that they've got available to us, I think it's gonna be easiest to just head on over to the search bar and you can type in BBC, and you'll see the BBC Symphony Orchestra Discover is the first one that comes up. That is the one you're looking for. That is the free version of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. If you type in labs, some of these different lab options come available to you. All you need to do is select one of them, just get the plugin purchased and purchased, it's free. And then it, essentially what Spitfire has you do is download their app, which you can actually download the libraries from. So you just need to create an account on their website, get some of these free versions purchased, download the app that they send you in the confirmation email or however it works, I don't entirely remember. Um, but the important thing is really to get to the next step, which is to get the app downloaded onto your computer. So once you've got the app downloaded, this is what it looks like. Uh, there's the My Products window, and you can see here, these are the libraries that I own from Spitfire. Then there's this Labs window, uh, there's a download room window and a settings window. Um, before I talk about downloading the plugins, I'm going to talk about, unfortunately, now I have to talk about a piece of technology that I was going to hold off on talking about until the technology video, but I kind of need to talk about it now when it comes to downloading sample libraries. Um, I've been thinking about how to organize the different pieces of technology that you need and the equipment you need when it comes to writing music. And I think I'm going to have a category that's titled something along the lines of like, not technically necessary, but necessary. And an external hard drive is going to be one which is going to fall in that category where it's technically not necessary. But if you really want to do this and have your computer function at a good and decent level and run these sample libraries well and smoothly without a ton of hiccups and bugs and glitches and without your computer being super slow, Getting an external hard drive is gonna make a huge, huge difference to the functionality of your libraries. So what you want is a solid state drive. You do not want a hard disk drive. The HDD hard disk drive is gonna run super slow and it's gonna be a total nightmare. They're cheaper, so I bought that when I went to buy an external hard drive for the first time. I didn't know that. Um, and I was running my sample libraries off of that for a few years before I finally got around to buying the SSD that I'm currently using and it has made so much difference. I thought that up until this point, it was my RAM holding me back. It was really the solid state drive when it came to loading my sounds and not having them glitch within my DAW. 
So I'm going to have a link down to the one I purchased off of Amazon. It is a Samsung SSD two terabyte. I would really probably recommend starting at the two terabyte range. Sample libraries, unfortunately, are still very, very big for the most part. And so if you're going to actually buy a professional library at some point, definitely consider getting a two terabyte SSD. If you're still just considering whether or not this is for you and you're only going to download the BBC Symphony Orchestra Discover and Labs, the two free plugins, and you know you're just going to leave it at that for a little while, then don't rush into buying an external hard drive. This is really only if you know you're at a point where you want to buy libraries and they start to pile up in size as you get more and more microphone positions, more and more articulations, they're just going to get really big. To give you an idea, I believe that the full BBC Symphony Orchestra, the professional edition, is over 600 gigabytes. That's really big. And if you try and run that on your computer, first off, you're probably going to run out of space. And second off, it's just going to slow down everything tremendously. So if you have an SSD, here's what you want to do within the Spitfire Audio app. You want to go to your settings and you want to go to default content path. And now what you want to do is click on this and set it to your SSD. Mine came labeled T7. I just never changed it, but this is my SSD. Um, it'll There'll be a, a library on your computer that it'll default to. It'll be called something like Spitfire Audio or something like that. Uh, a library that it'll make once the plugin or once the application itself downloads. Uh, if you don't have an external hard drive, you can just leave it there. That's fine. But this is where you want to get it set up so that when you download your plugins, they go to your external hard drive. Now, in order to get them downloaded, I actually have everything downloaded, so I don't really think I can give you a great example unless there's a new labs, which has not been installed, which I don't. Um, but if your plugin has not been installed, there'll be a little button underneath it that says install, and all you're going to do is click on that, and assuming you've got your default, your, your download path set correctly, it should download straight to your SSD. You can have, head on over to the downloading tab to check your progress. Obviously, it's going to uh, take different amounts of time depending on the size of the sample library and the speed of your internet. So once your sample library has been downloaded, the next step to do is to restart your DAW. Now, most DAWs should be set up in such a way that they automatically scan external hard drives and that they automatically scan your computer for newly installed VSTs or plugins. If not, I'm going to try and leave some links maybe to some videos regarding um, problem solving with finding plugins. I will say 95% of the time I've downloaded a new plugin, it's appeared in Ableton just fine. The other 5% I've had to do some Googling. Sometimes it's a problem that's specific to that plugin. Sometimes it's a problem that's specific to the DAW or my computer or the version of the computer that I'm running. Unfortunately, Part of dealing with this means dealing with computer problems. It's going to be annoying at times. You're probably going to swear at your computer once or twice in trying to get some of this technology to work. That is another part of this process. It's just that technology is not always going to work. Um, there's going to be a day where you will want to sit down and do music and it's going to take you an hour to even get the DAW open. Sometimes the DAW might not even work. I sell that just to prepare you. It's not that often. I think the technology is at a pretty good spot and it's pretty reliable. But I will show you a couple of things to check in Ableton specifically. And I imagine there's a similar thing in other DAWs, but of course I know Ableton the best. So what I'm going to do to get my preferences up is I'm going to do command comma. And then I'm going to go to the plugins tab. So one thing to just try if your plugin isn't appearing in your plugin bar is to just simply hit the rescan button. I'm not going to do that now because it'll rescan through all the plugins I have and that'll take a little while because I've got quite a few. But if your plugin is downloaded properly and maybe Ableton just glitched when it was opening, uh, you can hit rescan and sometimes this will work and solve the problem. I'm not going to be able to give you advice that applies to every type of problem solving when it comes to this. So all I'm going to say for now is check the rescan button, uh, restart your computer. A lot of the times that'll do it. Um, and then if that's still not working, then unfortunately you got to hop on the Google and try your best to figure it out. And also don't be afraid to reach out to customer service with the plugin that you just purchased or the sample library you just purchased or with Ableton. Um, it is their responsibility to help you if you cannot get the product that you just purchased installed. So the last thing I would like to talk about before this video ends is VST3, VST, and audio unit Ableton has these three different versions of plugins available to us. You'll notice that in this drop down menu, you can see VST3, VST, AUV2 stands for audio unit. Don't need to worry about the V2. I'm not even sure what it means. 
Um, some DAWs, like I believe Logic only has audio units available. They don't even have VSTs. Um, most plugins will come with all of these different versions and func because they want to function in every DAW possible. It's to a sample library's best interest to be functional in as many DAWs as possible. So the vast majority of the time, you don't need to worry about this, but do make sure that the sample library that you're buying, check the description, figure out what kind of plugin it is. Is it a VST3? Is it an audio unit? And is that compatible with your DAW? Every once in a while, it might not be, but rarely is this gonna be something you're gonna to have to worry about. Now you'll notice, for example, like the BBC Symphony Orchestra, if I type in BBC, it's gonna appear in all three of these. There's a VST3 version, a VST, and an audio unit. Like it's gonna work no matter your DAW for the most part, the BBC Symphony Orchestra. And this is true for a lot of plugins. So all this really comes down to is sort of behind the scenes stuff that I'll be honest, I don't really understand. It's just tech stuff, but it doesn't affect the performance of the plugin so far as I know. I mean, maybe it affects it somehow, but I've never noticed a difference dragging in the BBC Symphony Orchestra from the audio unit or the VST or the VST3. I'm just gonna throw this in the category of if you're interested, do some more Googling, but for now, all you need to know is that it works. And just so long as you get it appearing in one of these folders, you should be in good shape. So I'm gonna leave it there for now. I'm gonna end the video here and I will catch you all in the next one. Take care.